Hello everybody, my name is Bun Hui from the Institutum and I'm here uh, this afternoon with uh, Singapore artist Shubigi Rao who other than being an artist of course is now currently also artistic director and curator of the upcoming Kochi Biennial. Hello Shubigi. Hi Bun Hui. Hi, so uh, we were talking before uh, that, that uh, about the trajectory of your artistic practice since you moved from, from India to Singapore mm. quite some time ago. In mm. fact, you were saying this year is already, how many years has it been? 20. Let's start uh, from, from the, the beginning. Were you already actively practicing in, in India before you arrived mm. in Singapore? And what mm. happened when, when mm -hmm. you came to this uh, place that admittedly the art scene is quite different from India. Yes, and quite different in a way that gladdened my heart when I came. This was of course the 90s, we were speaking about um, the early 90s. Uh, I was very disillusioned with what was on offer at the time at places like Delhi College of Art and so on. So long story short, I decided to not study art at that time. Mm. And I was still making and I showed off and on sporadically. But I think for me, the joy of making was more important than actually showing and being part of um, the sort of the market. Um, even at that age, and I think I was around 19 at the time, um, I was I w just sort of said, I don't need this. I don't need the kind of nepotism that I thought bedeviled the, the scene at the time. I also didn't like um, some of the very paternalistic attitudes mm -hmm. um, and the idea that one couldn't um, sort of get ahead unless you were actively mentored. In other words, you sort of, and, and I'll quote, I was told you need to apprentice. Mm. <laughs> I'm using a milder term than what I was mm. told. Wash their linen, um, cook their food, and mm. just basically be their dog's general dog's body. They may impart some knowledge, but that, that's not the point, because as long as you're associated and seen with them, within 10 years, any gallery will show you. Uh -huh. And I just, at that moment, I just felt such rage. And I, th I knew that this was not the trajectory that I wanted and made sense, it didn't make sense to me at all. And I happened to come to Singapore and I think I was around 26, 27 at the time. Mm. What year and was that? Um, well, 20 years ago then, uh, <laughs> 2001. I came, interestingly enough, at the time that LaSalle had its graduation show mm. and I, I went there and I knew instantly this was where I belonged. And mm. the first thing I did when I came here was to enroll in LaSalle. Ah. And I already had a degree in English Lit and I was actually almost done with my Masters in Ecology and Environmental Studies but I didn't care enrolled at the diploma level mm. and um, I just wanted to learn and I just had this desire to be part of a process which wasn't so much about instruction but just to s um, sort of seep myself completely mm. in a context that I felt I'd never wanted to be part of. Mm. So it was a, quite a radical change within me as well. It For the first time I wanted to belong mm. and it really felt like that. I, I felt like I was home. It was such a strange thing. I mean, I knew the, when I came to Singapore, this was where I belonged. I quite faithfully yeah. stuck my way out with LaSalle all the way till my master's. I did my ah. master's from LaSalle as well. And then um, I'd started teaching also at LaSalle when I finished my uh, BA. Mm. Um, so I, I've been affiliated with LaSalle for a very long time. Mm. I taught there for 11 years as a part-timer. And um, I think the thing with, with LaSalle was, it wasn't the institution so much, but it was really the people that I was around. Of course, mm. my peer group. Um, it's always fantastic to finally be part of a group that you collaborate with mm. and you um, have a lot of fun with. But also, I think I really enjoyed the, the conversations with supervisors. I didn't see them as people as, who spoke from a position of authority. I, I saw all our conversations as a give and take. And therefore, it was much more natural, the flow, mm. and, um, and so much more illuminating. So even a conversation with a supervisor who didn't get my work at all was also very illuminating. Ah. So I wasn't here seeking training. I wasn't here seeking that degree. I didn't really need that. I just needed to be part of that conversation yeah. and also to figure out where I stood. So I was reinventing my position and I, and I needed to do that to, to realize what I believed in and what I was opposed to. Mm. So it crystallized um, some of the things I cared deeply about, which mm. is why within a year of moving here, I did my first 10 year project. What you're saying is very interesting coincidentally because you know the, the two other artists we've been speaking to, Rizman Putra mm. and Choi Ka Fai, they, they, they also came from basically La Salle and they also spoke of how mm. in the early 2000s, yes. not, not the formal curriculum, but how there was a kind of community oh, yes. of exchange, of free exchange mm. and, and, and a kind of energy Yes. Of, of artists and teachers, you know, yes. it also sort of suggests, you know, that early 2000 period, at least in Singapore, as a kind of moment, 
you know, where there was a, a kind of energy mm. and a kind, a specific kind of artistic inquiry that was coming out. One of the things that happened also was that a lot of the people born around the time of 75, mm. um, the contemporary artists we know yes. today, right, were also returning from their studies in places like goldsmiths and so yes. on, right? And so they would come back and not only would they begin practicing with that other sort of outside point of view, but also they were teaching. Mm. I know because a number of them were, were mm. teaching at Pisal, for instance. Mm. So we were exposed to um, a, quite a different understanding of what is contemporary practice and uh, contemporary thought. Now that's not always a good thing, but in this case I think that the energy was excellent mm. because you still had um, LaSalle's um, ethos that Brother Joseph McNally intended. Mm. So for instance, there was no demarcation really between your area of specialization and other people. So mm. for instance, I, I graduated with a BFA and a an, um, master's in painting. I never painted, not once. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I did everything but that and it didn't matter. Yeah. You could do absolutely anything you wanted. Yeah. And the idea was simply that your, whatever you produce should have fidelity to yes. your idea. Yes. In other words, no bullshit. So there was no hierarchy happening. Mm. So for instance, between printmakers and painters, there's definitely a hierarchy that happens right now. Yes, yeah? of there's course. There's no question. And it's a tremendous pity because I know as a painter who was only doing printmaking for a very long time or ceramics, there was no, no, no hierarchy at all. I mean, mm. we were all part of the same groups and the energy was really fantastic. Mm. People were, all, were also very generous with their yes. skill sharing. You know, you can't do printmaking or ceramics without people helping you or you helping other people. So um, whether it's outdoor raku firing or anything, I mean, these are things that cannot happen in a building like the current La Salle, for instance. Yeah. You can't do these things. Yeah. But, uh, and also because at that time in the, on the, in the old campus, there were no keypads and there was yeah. no entry as such. I mean, you could just go in and sit in for yeah. anything. So what I did was, and I loved this because I'm such a geek, I sat in for every class that I could. So, uh, you know, you're only supposed to sign up for one yes. theory and one history class. Yes. Yeah, I sat in for everything, soaked up information like a sponge. But I also soaked up things like teaching methods. So I was absorbing at multiple levels. And um, that's also partly because I hyper-focus on many different things at the same time. And it's a very exhausting way to live. But it's it's ideal if you're in, in if you were in an institution like the old La Salle. Yeah. So going back to you were mentioning that's also the period that was the genesis of your ten year yeah. uh, project. Could you speak about about that? What was for you the genesis oh. of that? And because that remains also a very important thread. Yes. In, in your in your practice? So what I did was, um, the first 10 years of all my work, I did it under a male pseudonym. Yes. So it's just a, it's just me with the paper moustache because he's my paper tiger. Yeah. Um, but he was the necessary front that I needed. And my, my one of the, I think, um, survival mechanisms that my brain has employed, it sort of did this from the time I was a very young child, is that whenever I was angry, it would come out as humour. Mm. Um, it's it's a survival mechanism, but it's also um, it's a twofold survival mechanism. One mm. is that it, the rage would not exhaust me, mm. right, and um, and create a sense of deep misery or apathy. Mm. The second thing was rage is one of the most unendearing qualities that you can display yeah. in a conversation. If you it's, want to convince someone, humor is one of the best ways to slip a controversial yeah. idea across. Yeah. And it it's not some it's not an artifice that I've employed. The humor is not an artifice. It comes out when I don't want it to come out as well. Yes. So I can come across as being facetious about a very difficult subject, but that's also probably because I've suffered that issue. And I think that mm. by creating S. Raul, who's a degendered but also de-ethnicized version of me, he could embody all the qualities that I suspected I had but couldn't say without coming across as arrogant. Mm. So um, it's very unseemly for a woman to claim to be polymathic in her interests or in her oh, work okay. or discipline. But he's been called a polymath by everyone else but me. I don't need to say it because yes. he really was. And uh, I was merely the naive protege, the <laughs> you know the booth girl who would present his work, or the biographer after the fact, scrupulously and earnestly and erroneously recording his thoughts. Um, and also because I'm the person in charge of his archives, I can posthumously create work yes. every time an S. Raoul work is demanded, even though I killed him ten, uh, in, in 2013 yes. after 10 years. <laughs> but he also was a great way to deflect attention away from me as a person, as, I've, as I'm sure you've gathered now. I was very uncomfortable growing up with the constant spotlight on the person, not the content. Mm. I think the content should speak before mm. the artist. But or it's an does. interesting strategy to sort of have that front that deflects yes. some things that need to be deflected yeah. or, or, or is a shield, you know. Uh, but yet, because 
the assistant, which is you yes. in, in that world that mm. you constructed, is both the subservient assistant, the, the one that provides certain essential services, but also because you're the archivist, yeah. you're the person that writes the yes. biography, is also the person imbued with a lot of power. power. It's sort of like like a bamboo curtain. Yes, you it know? is. And it was, a de it was deliberate because um, I was also the manipulator. Mm. So the very first text I actually wrote is called Bastardizing Biography. Mm. And it's about biography as literary gossip. It excavated biography as uh, not just a form of literary revisionism, because I also do love literature, though I can see the problems with um, biographical, mm. a lot of biographical work. Mm. Uh, what it also does is it, it's, it's imbued, whether you like it or not, with the subjectivities of the biographer. Mm. And that's something that was very important for me to do. So this first text that I wrote, which I wrote in an hour, um, and I was a student at the time when I wrote it, I think this was 2004. Mm -hmm. And then I looked at it and I said, you know, that's, that's actually what I believe, that <laughs> it's, um, you know, I do not believe in pretend objectivity, mm -hmm. and I'm going to embrace all the things we're told not to, mm -hmm. which is essentially don't be subjective, don't be emotive. The, the word empathetic didn't yet have currency. Okay. This is really important to remember. Okay. We, call it, it, we call it empathy now. Yes. But what I was talking about is the books I read, I have the ideals of the enlightenment man, but I have the squishy innards of the romantic. Mm. Everything that I did, I, I quite openly declared my subjectivities. Mm. Being a biographer of someone who did not exist, it was possible for me to do that again. So mm. my biographies of S. Raoul, whether they appear as artwork or text, it doesn't really matter because every single time, or even if it's just lab studies, there's all this really strange sentimentality, but also really strange sexual references. There's a lot of, there's a lot going on and um, ambivalent relationships between parents and children. Yes. So they are things that seem tangential and, and irrelevant to the work itself, which is say, proving that contemporary art deliberately deranges the brain. It's a, it was a proper neuroscientific work. I was working out so many things, my ideas about religion, spirituality, um, relationships, um, uh, oppression and everything, but in a way, and I was doing it through say a jellyfish. Mm. So I could only do that as S. Raoul. I think as mm. Shubhigi, I would have been hard pressed to have to constantly explain, but because there was this mythic, but never, it is this never visible figure of S. Raoul, mm. people only looked at the work and mm. they figured out stuff on their own, no mm. one to spoon feed them. Mm. And I think that relationship between the artwork and the viewer was so beautiful. It, what's really interesting is that the whole uh, project, I f when I first read about it, I thought it was really fascinating in the way that it made it very clear, the way that it was set up, uh, that the subjectivity was actually built into this objective world Absolutely. that was to be built. The second thing that I, I noticed, and it goes back to you know your interest in the archive, archival documents, memoirs, mm. biographies, you know, scribblings of tags and mm. doodling and, and all that is how interesting it again it's not limited to the world of artistic creation. In our mm. life today, these actually are the things yeah. that make up our world, that yeah. create that legacy, that construct. Because in the end it's not a solid building. It's, yeah. it's these structures yeah. of memory and meaning in yes. our mind, these filters, right? And that whole project I thought was really fascinating because it really was pushing these subjective filters, structures, axial points right in your face. I really like what you said about subjectivities in a kind of, of seemingly objective frame. Mm. And that's why I employed so much pseudoscience. Mm. Um, at, in, at the beginning, I taught myself um, neuroscience so that I could do a credible neuroscientific work, the tuning fork of the mind. Mm. That work was also shown at the Global Congress of, of Neuroscientists. So oh, 3,000 yeah. neuroscientists saw that bloody work. The paper was peer reviewed and published and it's a hoax, the whole really? bloody thing is yes, a hoax. I remember. And I, I'm the secondary author, of course. Um, the woman can't be the primary author. Um, S. Raoul was the primary author. I presented this paper on his behalf because he was dead by then. I think it takes no time and effort to immediately realize that this intensely layered work or this work that's taken an incredible amount of, say, scholarship or or, or study, it's eventually presented in a way that's almost silly. So for instance, my neuroscientific work, I, I actually studied neuroscience so I could do the, write the paper. Mm -hmm. And it worked because I finally met a Nobel Prize winning neuroscientist who loved the work. He mm. couldn't believe that an artist had done this. So uh, this is very important to me, that there'll be s genuine scholarship, but it doesn't have to be presented with a view to make me look smart. That's mm. not why I do it. Mm. I do it because I'm in love with knowledge and I mm. just geek out over stuff. Mm. But it doesn't mean that, it, that the display, eventual display, 
um, embodies that, which is also why I did not do a solo for the 10 years of the S. Rahul project. Uh -huh. And a lot of people thought I was lighting a match to my career by doing it. And I mm. never saw it that way. This was me just wanting to make work for the love of it, to read for the love of it and not mm. have to justify it. Mm. I was working through my entire ethos, my personal philosophies, mm. but also what I meant to the world and what is it, what is my place in the world. Mm. Um, and I know these are things that you should work out in your teens, but I was, and I was doing it at the ripe old age of between 27 to 33, but it was, it was very necessary that I do it then. So I feel in a way my life really began when I started this S. Rahul project, which is the year I came to Singapore. Mm. Now we come to, and you speak a lot about the book. Yes. The book as a, not just a physical book, as a conceptual yes. tool and a conceptual carrier of meaning. Mm -hmm. uh, that's very important in a lot of mm. your work. You know, to take it literally, you, you actually have won the Singapore Literature, <laughs> Literature Prize for a mm -hmm. book as a visual artist, yes. you know? Yeah, tell yeah. us tell us a bit more about, okay. about that. There's a yeah. lot of really strange things about this. So the Pulp Project, uh, which I started the year, I killed a, uh, the Estral Project. Ended. Yes. All of this was happening towards the end of the Estral Project. I was also a bit fed up of him, to be mm. honest. And so he tripped over my work and broke his neck. So his obituary <laughs> read, he died while attempting to negotiate space in a cultural context. <laughs> so um, once I killed him, I had my first solo, which yes. was actually a retrospective which is ridiculous because your first solo cannot be your retrospective. retrospective. Also, you don't get to do your own retrospective. Yeah. So I was again thumbing my nose at a lot of these ideas, um, but not in a mean-spirited way, I have to say. Yeah. By calling it the retrospectacle of S. Raoul, um, I was trying to, in the sense, say that the heart of the, the work is not the exhibition, but the book that came out with mm. it. Right? And that was called History's Malcontents, The Life and Times of S. Raoul. Mm. So again, I signaled quite clearly that it's not only the life of the man, but also the times in which he lived and operated and what that does to you, how we are so shaped by these multiple um, intersectional contexts, right? Yes. I also had my second solo the same year, yes. and it was called Useful Fictions, and you can see some of the drawings behind us now, as a matter of fact. And it was a series of 16 drawings based on a very simple idea that all human concepts are simply useful fictions. By the time I did Useful Fictions, it was a mere six months after S. Raoul had ended, which mm. meant that all these ideas were already there. They mm. didn't germinate after. It's also the same year, this is 2013, where I, for the first time, applied to NAC for money. Ah. Because I now knew that for what I needed to do, I could not manage it on my own. I used to use yeah. the money I earned from teaching part time to fund my projects, to fund fund my work. Yeah. So I applied for the creation grant, and to my shock and horror, I got it. Um, <laughs> because now it meant I had to take this project seriously, and it was called Pulp: A Short Biography of the Banished Book, and that's my current ten year project. Mm. And the reason it's called Pulp is because um, it's a sense. Again, it goes back to what I was talking about, where I like to almost be facetious or mm -hmm. trivialize the thing that I care really deeply about. Mm. Part of it is a form of extreme self-deprecation that I've employed again as a defense mechanism because I've been so used to not being listened to growing up and always feeling that whatever I think about is either embarrassing or too intense or too irritating or too depressing or just in other words that it's not worth listening to. Okay. But under the umbrella of Pulp, a short biography of the banished book, I, I can actually talk about anything. Yeah. So in a sense, I'm as liberated as I was, or as freed as I was when I did the Estral project. Uh, my pulp books are self-published under a, so I set up a publishing firm. Ah. Uh, it exists. It's real. It's real. It's absolutely it's real. Not it's not a totally real. construct. No, it's real. One of the things I also do is I realized that there were so many artists I admired who couldn't mm. get their books published. I don't publish people, but I do secretly give out um, the legitimizing like, you know, I'll give, I'll get them, and I'll give them an ISBN, or I'll, I'll just legitimize the work. So, because also you can't submit um, self-published books for a lot of prizes, yes. and also for uh, for reviews, they don't yes. get reviews. Yes. The Straits Times refused to review the first pulp book, yes. not because it was self-published, but as one of them told me, uh, we didn't know in which genre to place your book. Mm. So this idea that your your work must fit in a box, which as you can imagine, is something I've never done. Yeah. Um, again, it was seen as a problem. We can't yes. review your book. We liked it, can't review it because we don't know under which heading to put it on the. Okay. So um, again, this is a book that's occupying multiple um, positions, but again, it's one where the autonomy preserved. Yeah. So uh, I'm also very inspired by things like the Panama Papers. Mm. So I've always wanted to set up my own shell companies. Uh, <laughs> and, and I think to a certain extent, this is the first step towards doing that. Yeah. Um, and it's not because I want to launder money, because that's really, I don't, that's not of no interest to me. But I'm really interested in the mechanisms by which we obfuscate 
the our processes there's a lot that we don't want to made apparent and mm. we're actually un deeply uncomfortable with the nakedness of our processes laid bare for all to yeah. see um so even right now speaking as i am i'm actually a little bit uncomfortable over the fact that i would disclose my plans for shell companies and such <laughs> but i really think it's quite a lovely idea to never for people to never know the origin of things as you were speaking of the word that came to my mind is yeah that's why our lives is are made up of fictions yes, you yes. need you need necessary fiction fictions. there are necessary uh fictions otherwise you, you just could not yeah. function and sometimes the fictions may may actually even mm. be amnesia Yes. Uh, you need to just forget certain things yep. otherwise you know you you will always be in that constant yeah. state of remembering <laughs> yeah. and of course the historians will will always say well wow, that's what singapore is right you mm. need to forget certain things mm. in order to look to dream mm -hmm. of the future yes. otherwise you'll be in a constant state of recovery yes i quite firmly believe that it's yeah. necessary to be constantly excavating the past mm. you should not be covering up the past um, i so i don't know if it's about remembering because remembering is almost a passive thing and also memory is an extremely fraudulent mm. so i don't trust memory at all mm. um especially my own our present is in flux our future is unknown but you have a better apprehension of your present and especially your present positions and your mm -hmm. present way of thinking if you are also excavating the past and putting things together because we read differently all the time and i think we we have more faith in our ability to go forward if we are not disconnected from our past and if we are oblivious about our present philosophies mm. so you can only know your present philosophies by constantly excavating the past and these are not contrary things and one doesn't take away energy from the other you know even though when we talk about concept based work and your mm. work has a lot of concepts is playing with epistemology yeah. how we process the world what also struck me when i saw the work in kochi was how aesthetically beautiful mm -hmm. Mm. it was even while it was extremely uh complex and mm. weighty mm. in its concept and two again tying back to what you say how much it really was an excavation of that very site mm -hmm. that you are actually encountering the mm. world that conjunction you know of the actual physical site yes. and the historical information that you're getting but filtered through that that aesthetic lens of yeah. the the video say a little about you know how about your approach to uh you know this kind of excavation mm. of of local context and mm. and histories thank you that's because books to me are not objects they mm. are the embodiment of a human being who wrote them or the human being who wrote them and i think the reason that i was never lonely growing up is because i felt part of this conversation with people i'd never met separated mm. by time space and geography and i also don't valorize them they're not sacred mm. objects to me but i also know that books to me are a distillation of humanity mm. um and they're a great vehicle through which to talk about what it is that makes us human um i'm i'm so glad you brought up the the work i did for the kochi biennale in 2018 because that's very different to all the film i'd made before um and part of the reason is this i didn't realize it but i had because i i, I was so happy to be here in singapore that i had absorbed a little too much of the aesthetics of production mm. and perfectionism Mm. that i think had begun to bedevil my work i mean it had it had begun to seep through to the point where i was rejecting certain aesthetic choices simply because i thought they flattened the work mm. and i've always i've always argued against looking at the image of things mm. i've argued that art is not tv and yes it's important to have that sort of work that you can mm. apprehend immediately it's great mm. i think there's enough place for all of that mm. but i didn't want my work to have that mm. and so i was rejecting a very necessary part of my vocabulary i had blinded myself to the reality rather that i absolutely loved a certain lushness because i am in love with certain things about the world i mm. do love being alive mm. i know i'm kind of bit what a genetic lottery i've struck mm. to even be alive mm. and i really do love the lushness of of life and all of that and a lot of that has been stripped away from living in a city first of all especially mm. a hyper modern city like singapore because i grew up in the himalaya which where you mm. very aware of your environment constantly mm. if you're not it can kill you will mm. die of exposure okay and when i went to kochi like i do when i film in any place i that ethos of that place overcomes me and i embrace that feeling of being overwhelmed mm. and overcome and just feeling unmoored mm. from all my ideas of how to film and how to work mm. again it helps that i've not had formal training in film that really helps there's no sort of internal editor up here mm. or internal technical expert saying you're doing it wrong
Mm. You know, so for instance, Coach was the first time I deliberately worked with massively overexposed film, blown out highlights and everything. Mm. And it was necessary to do that because I needed that white out. I mm. needed that idea that because I wanted to signal am, the amnesia of history, right? And I could do that through those transitions. And and this made visual sense to me. So the aesthetics were critical in telling the story. Mm. I actually wrote the script after I finished editing the visuals. Oh really? Yes, there was. How I went in there blind. There was no story. I had nothing. I just let the place inform me. I stayed there for seven weeks, and I only go to film on three days. Of course, being India, a lot of the things that I needed to do, I couldn't get access to. The Kochi work is my Plan C film, actually. Mm. Yeah, and I still think it's better than anything I could have done yeah. because I, I had this idea of working with the archives and so on. Yeah. I didn't get access to a single archive. Oh really? Yeah, okay. but what I did was get access to junkyards, pulping stations, and so on. Mm. I got. Access to the end of the book. We return to the pulp yes. again. So it was it was actually actually uh, perfect. That point you made about after you finished the film, yes. then you wrote, wrote the, the script. script. The visuals told me what to do, and even at the mm. time of editing, I feel transitions. As a lover of film, mm. and I'm really a film addict. Mm. Um, I I think I've learned by immersing myself. That's one of the best ways to learn. I immerse myself in film, I immerse myself in Kochi. Mm. So that work is very informed by the this, this place in which it was shown as well. Mm. A couple of examples. Um, I didn't, I couldn't get to go on a boat. So yes. all the scenes you see of the the prow of the boat, boat over the thing, it's actually the, the sharp steel um, roof. It's the edge looking, jutting out over the water of the balcony that you stepped onto. Oh, really? Once you saw the work. Yes, yes, okay. it's all trickery. Okay. It's all trickery. Go back and look I'm at very low, I have lo-fi solutions. Lo-fi. Lo-fi <laughs> solutions for everything. <laughs> A lot of the the sections of the film actually shot in the same rooms where it was shown, uh. and that's the way I work. I work very much with the site. I'll yes. work with what the site says, what it does, and I've done that always with the with Esraul with my archaeology work. The objects spoke to me and mm. told me what relationships yeah. they had with each other. Um, with the Kochi film and with all my films, the visuals inform me. Mm. So I don't go in with a storyboard or a script or narrative. But trust me, it's a very nerve wracking way to work. To be fair, when I saw it, I did. Even it didn't register at first that it was your work mm. because, of course, uh, yes. you know the way you bundled through a, a biennial. I'm not a journalist yeah. or anything. I'm like, okay, there's a work. Let's go and see it later. Yeah. Then we figure, wow, I like this. <laughs> who's who's the artist? But this work really has a resonance mm. with the site yes. in a way that you know everyone talks and curators love talking using this term called site specific. But mm. I always have problems with that. But I think you know that was a work that really had a kind of resonance with the site, not I just think. physical in terms of what the imagery is, but I just felt a kind of there's a kind of worn melancholy yes. about that building, which yeah. is especially to me was heightened because the the sea yeah. was so well. Potentially violent, you could yes, feel you could the feel, wind yeah. and 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 the energy in the water. I think you need to trust your sight. You mm. need to trust that the okay, the storm's not always going to be there. Yes, but it's going to be there for some people, and yeah. it it's going to add to your work, not not distract from it. Mm. So I I never suffer the anxiety of oh you know inclement weather or fog horns from the ships outside are going to interfere with the audio that I have in my work because I'm not so precious about my work yeah. anyway, yeah. and I I I'm actually not very good working with pure white cube spaces mm. because I feel yes the work will function, it'll function, but mm. I want them to also. Fall in love with the things that pe most people regard as peripheral, um, but like you've apprehended straight away, which yeah. is the, the, the way you've described the water, you describe mm. the air, and that mm. heaviness you describe mm. is very much the tropical storm. I, I mean, we know this, we feel it, and yeah. you can insinuate it in the work without actually depicting it. Yeah. You'll notice there are no stormy waters in my work, so I'm talking yes. about very turbulent ideas yeah. without showing turbulent images, yeah. and that's again something that's quite easy to do because you don't need that exposition. Of mm. narrative through visual or text, mm. right? So the insinuation of things is so much more enjoyable because the person's, the viewer's brain then fills in the blanks, and they do it by listening to the site. And in terms of my newer projects, that also seeps in a little bit here and there. The National Parks has has an exhibition on that's actually opening, I think, in a couple of days, or maybe even tomorrow. Oh, I've forgotten. And it's um, actually about the rare books in their collection. And one of the books, of course, is the famous hottest Malabaricas, yes. which is about by the Kochi region, the Malabar coast, yeah. um, and it's a it's a book commissioned by the Dutch, and you can see this in the Kochi work too. That um, um, Kochi, that, that area was colonized by three different colonial yes. powers, right? The Portuguese, Portuguese, and then the Dutch, Dutch and then the, the English. English. 
And so the Hottest Mala Barracus was actually um, a very long project, a very intense project, it's 12 volumes of the, of the flora of the region. And interestingly enough, um, because again it was a colonial enterprise to quite an extent, um, the, a lot of the painters were actually Indians whose names are largely forgotten. Mm. And that's the case with a lot of the beautiful um, books of natural history that we have. My parents actually had a natural history library. So some of the books that I saw in the botany library in um, botanic like gardens that. are books that we have lost. Mm. So there was this pain again um, that I was reminded of. One of the things that I embraced, of course, was the exquisite beauty of these books. Mm. But I could also see as an Indian, um, there were these hints of rebellion. Well, I'm mm. saying rebellion, but that's probably not it. It's mm. hints of origin, perhaps, mm. where you could tell the painter was an Indian because there was a certain form of creating repeat, repetitive pattern. Okay. Uh, there's a certain use of color yeah. that betrays that origin that in a very delightful way. That Yes. That, that generic objectivity yes. that because it's scientific yes. so they try and yes. portray. Yes. Yeah. Initially a lot of the the plates or images had mm. groups of people mm. of, of Indians, mm. right? Over time that was removed. Oh really? Oh. Yeah, because the whole whole Western taxonomic system is about the removal of original context. Yes. Right? What is the what is lineal naming nomenclature? Yes. Yes. Uh, Latin nomenclature for flora and fauna yeah. says nothing about beyond genus and family. Yeah. It says nothing about uh, where it's from, what it eats, what eats it. Is mm. it medicinal? Is it dangerous? None of that. But our yeah. uh, indigenous names have that knowledge, have mm. that information. So when you name something, you name it because it's either useful or poisonous. Uh, you name it as a warning, but it also speaks of the biome within which it grows. Yes. So things that grow in the, in the same ecological niche have names that speak to each other. All of that's abs absent in Linnaean taxonomy, mm. right? So I wanted to allude to that form of naming as ownership, but also the eradication of the original context. And again, I wanted to do it in a non, uh, in the way I usually do, where it's not didactic, you mm. know. What I did was over the, all the years of, of photo taking, um, I used some of my own photographs over time because I don't have those books anymore, the books mm. I've lost. But I also used images from um, the rare books in the and you're library. you're juxtaposing, I juxtaposing your yes. images with, with images yes. from these botanical yes. books. And they don't make immediate sense. So you'll see an aesthetic relationship, for instance, perhaps um, an echo of form, an echo uh, uh, of color, maybe the echoes or the resonances are in very obvious formalistic ways, right? Mm. But there's also deeper conceptual resonance, which mm. you will now look at because your mind is drawn to the, the beauty of the images. Mm. And so I've realized beauty is an excellent hook as well, as much as humor is. <laughs> so while I can't employ a lot of humor, sadly, when I talk about book burning and such, um, and genocide, bit hard to be funny about that. So I've realized that actually um, aesthetics, it's also a form of comfort and solace. Mm. And we do draw solace in the preservation of beauty. Yes. And I realized this when I was speaking to survivors from the siege of Sarajevo, which as we know is the longest siege of modern warfare. Speaking to people who survived that siege, mm. um, one of the things they did under sniper fire, under artillery fire, um, and they were deliberately targeted, they were busy smuggling out and saving paintings, sculptures, the culture, the so-called dead objects yes. of a civilization. Yes. Right, that's what they were saving. Yes. They saved 1.5 million books before the library went it's up amazing. in flames, right? I've spoken to a firefighter who battled the, the flames for three days and three nights while his colleagues was, were, were hit by sniper fire and artillery fire as they were as they were attempting to save the, the, books. the, the books. People putting themselves in physical harm's mm. way, doing mm. it, and they were exhausted by the siege already. Mm. I mean, this is the longest siege, and these are civilians we're talking about, artists, writers, opera singers, actors, musicians, um, everyday people as well who mm. are not from the arts. Why would they do this? They would do this because there is solace, there's also redemption in the preservation of the cultural objects of our civilizations, mm. right? If you listen to indigenous forms of knowledge making, Beauty is knowledge and knowledge, and I don't mean beauty in the sense of talking the sublime, not at yeah. all. So for instance, if you look at the way medicinal knowledge is passed on orally, um, the knowledge of, of, of what can kill you and what can keep you alive through um, generations, it's either passed on through song mm. and it's beautiful. Oral tradition. Yes, yeah. but at the same time to use song is not a simple mnemonic device. Yeah. It's also because it's an act of beauty. Yeah. Passing on knowledge to someone else is a redemptive act. We know that, like, I, I don't want to glamorize what it's like to be a teacher, uh, to be a lecturer, but they are moments that are just so exquisitely, I just feel so lucky to be able to do that mm. and to be around minds that are much younger than mine. There's this kind of illumination that comes from mm. um, being slightly unsure of yourself as you articulate your ideas that uh, sometimes young people have when 
they realize for the first time because they're no longer in, in the school system. You see people open up for the first time and unfold. There's so much beauty in that. So this, this project that you're working on with the Botanic Gardens is yeah. historical uh, objects. What would likely be the... They asked for a I book, so I did a book. The outcome. Oh, Out, they a book. asked for a book, so I did a book. <laughs> but, a book. but I actually really wanted to do a work using only sound. Also something that I, I grew up with. Um, so for a certain part of um, my life, my parents decided to renounce the city and live in a jungle. Mm. Um, and we lived without electricity and we built our own mud hut. I'm not kidding, this is true. <laughs> Both my parents actually taught us how to identify alarm calls and also uh. what the alarm call was actually saying. So it's not as simple as that's an alarm call and that's just a mating call of a bird, no. Yeah. So the alarm call from monkeys is very specific when there's a leopard. Mm. But it's also, after some time you can figure out if it's a leopard who's eaten and if it's a leopard who's not eaten, uh. who's on the hunt. Um, you'll also find that alarm call picked up and travel really fast through the jungle by species that the leopard does not eat. Because there's a symbiotic relationship between, of sound, between prey species. So it's like an acoustic vehicle running through the forest much faster than the predator. The sound reaches you, the information reaches you yeah. before the danger reaches yeah. you. And that's why we lived for 10 years on that land and none of us were ever harmed. How fascinating. That means uh, now also sound in a sense from this perspective yeah. is also a, a kind of a body of knowledge Absolutely. that can be yeah. transmitted, which is exactly what the animals are, yes. are doing, right? Yes. Yes. So yeah. thank you so much for, yeah. for uh, sp uh, being with us mm -hmm. and speaking about your work thank in such depth and, mm -hmm. and range.